tekrar hoş geldiniz. Dünya Ekonomik Forumunun dün akşam açılışı vardı, Economic açılış resepsiyonumuz vardı. Had its opening reception ee, yesterday forumda, and uh, hepimiz biliyoruz ilk defa olarak as you very well e, know, Afrika, Orta Doğu, North Africa, Avrasya Middle East and uh, Eurasia e, bir, e, join in forumda. this meeting which is uh, for the first time in its history and we have to make use of our time as efficiently as uh, possible. In fact I'll take out my watch to keep track of time. Uh, we'll have an opening session right after our session where we will host our Prime Minister and I have to um, take him to the plenary at 10.15. So we have to be very punctual. Uh, we have already agreed with our panelists here. Um, we will talk uh, for three minutes each on two main topics. We will have two rounds on these two focus points. This will be followed by a Q&A session. We will try to keep the speeches short so that we can devote uh, a longer time for questions and answers. I apologize, but I don't want to have any one minutes here. So let us just finish on, try to finish on time. Uh, the first focus point is uh, nuclear energy after Fukushima. Now, as you know, um, the Fukushima incident changed the face and the reception of nuclear energy. Germany has wiped it off from its agenda. Is this the case? Should it be the case for everyone or not? If you allow me, I would like to give the floor to Turkey first. Because you probably know we have a 50,000 megawatt installed capacity in Turkey. And in 2023, uh, the plans are to increase this installed capacity um, to twice the current installed capacity. I leave the floor to the minister to tell us what we can do in this regard. Yes, ministers, distinguished representatives of the private and public sectors, it is a pleasure for me to address this session which brings together Eurasia, Middle East and Central Asia. We'll be talking about many issues, but before we do that, I'd like to welcome you all to this beautiful city. And uh, together with uh, our panelists here, I hope to have a fruitful discussion um, that will be very relevant both for Turkey and and for countries in the region. I also believe that uh, we will gain a lot from the discussion here. Now, of course, nuclear power plants are already quite numerous, more than 440 for the time in being. After the incident in Chernobyl, we saw that there are threats to this type of energy, but there are also opportunities. Safety measures need to be enhanced, and uh, technological developments have to be followed very closely. Safety uh, measures, in fact, have increased significantly after Chernobyl. 144 new plants uh, were est established, were set up after Chernobyl. And after the Fukushima incident, there are still 63 plants that are being constructed, that are in the pipeline. There are 26 nuclear power plants who are already older than 40 years. Now, this means they are aging and uh, new plans are being constructed in both the developed countries and developing countries. At least half of these uh, uh, nuclear power plants are located in France, the US and Japan. I don't have to remind you of their GDPs of these three powers. That means there is a correlation between 
development and the number of nuclear power plants, which means we can expect an increase in the number of power plants that will become operational in developing countries. What I'm trying to say is accidents like Fukushima have been very serious. There were three such incidents, such accidents in our history. But we see this has not, these accidents have not deterred the determination to build new plants. Some countries, yes, have given up on the idea, but I don't think we should interpret it as a complete neglect of the idea altogether. There are many countries. Um, such as Turkey, who are determined to build power plants, nuclear power plants. We have a serious demand. We have to build new um, capacity until 2023. That means we will have to build nuclear power plants uh, until 2023. We will make use of advanced uh, and modern technologies to make sure that we open and operate them properly. Uh, environment is an important issue, but I believe um, sessions on environment and sessions on energy should not focus on different issues. We should not come up with different solutions in different sessions. We need to find solutions that uh, serve both environmental concerns and energy concerns. I am a minister of energy, but I cannot say I'm not interested in environment or that my issues are not relevant for environment. I have to make sure that the solutions I find, the pricing of energy resources, are compatible with environmental concerns. Um, I have to make sure that primary energy uh, sources are priced um, properly. Everything has an impact. Pricing of primary energy resources, for instance, has an impact on our lives. We need to understand that whatever parameter uh, changes, this has an impact on the rest of the uh, sources and resources. There is a lot to discuss, but we agreed with the moderator that I have to be punctual, and that is why I'd like to finish here. Thank you very much. Senior Giuseppe Ricci is uh, from ENI in Italy and also a co-chair of the World Economic Forum. The, for, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And, um, we're definitely not a player in the nuclear um, industry, but uh, we leave the effect uh, of what the post-Fukushima uh, was because uh, Italy had uh, a relaunching plan for its nuclear uh, supply. And uh, right in the middle of it, uh, in the middle of having a political consensus, the Fukushima accident happened. And of course, uh, uh, when these things happen worldwide, the reaction is, uh, is always the same. It's uh, um, to face the problem from the worst possible angle and uh, try to fix any potential risk related to it. Um, the problem happens if this very difficult task is uh, um, demanded to the general public. And that's what's happened in Italy, actually, where a referendum was put in place. And of course, the result was uh, uh, a banning of the nuclear program, which, program, which uh, uh, I, I would say turned Italy into a freezing of any potential discussion about it for the next 50 years. Uh, so the next generation should come up, uh, have the need of it, uh, um, promote it, win the resistance uh, and, uh, and claim for a new uh, regulation in place. So um, Italy definitely is not a, uh, an active player in the moment. And so it's uh, facing the issue in terms of uh, um, energy security because uh, uh, it's, a, it's a given that um, any country needs to rely on diversification of resources, and so that's why I have different types of uh, energy production, and diversification of supply. And that's why, as, as far as possible, countries like Italy, and Italy is particularly good in this, um, have to secure their resources from uh, many different suppliers. We have uh, 
four big lines of supplies, one coming from Norway, one coming from Russia, one from Algeria, one from Libya. But they're never enough because uh, it's inherent in the energy game the fact that it is exposed to contingencies coming from either politics, and the Arab Spring is an example. Um, my country suffered a big risk of being short of energy in December of last year, and uh, actually any was uh, uh, good enough to uh, secure the supply from Libya right in time when the big chill hit Europe and Russia had to cut the supply of gas. So if we didn't have Libya at that moment, uh, Italy would have been uh, in a big shortage of, of gas supply. And, um, and, and so uh, th this is the key issue. And the, and the second uh, example is the, is the technical uh, aspect. So technology can really bring a big uh, change in the scenario, a big uncertainty. And we are facing this now because uh, if we think short term, uh, we might feel to be in a good shape in Europe. Um, and this connects very much with the topic of this um, of this uh, forum, which is the uh, Middle East, North Africa, and Eurasia interactions, uh, where Europe is uh, depending on uh, what's happening in uh, Eurasia, what's happening in Russia, what's happening in Turkey. And um, the economic crisis might put us now in, a, in good shape because the demand is lower. But if we look at this in a 10, 20 years uh, uh, term, uh, the figure change a lot. And we can discuss this in the second question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ricci. Shonda, by Right now, Mr. Ashti Havrami is representing the uh, Kurdish uh, region of Iraq. Uh, it is the, he's the Minister of Energy, so we'd like to hear uh, from you. Well, I'm uh, already in trouble dealing with oil and gas, so get it to me clear, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as Iraqi, as Iraq, uh, we are not nuclear, uh, just like uh, Italy, and hopefully we never be. Uh, I think, uh, but from world perspective and uh, development, nuclear is a must and is a future. Uh, I think, despite the regrettable incidents happen, uh, the technology is improving. Uh, on one hand, and environmental issues are important, of course, very important, and people learning from mistakes and redesigning and so on. On the other side, the other resources are declining. You know, oil and gas have been the main uh, energy source. We know it's not in abundance for hundreds of years. It eventually declines, so it has to be another source of uh, alternative source of energy, and nuclear probably is the primary one to be re-engineered and rethought and replanned. So from layman's term, because it's not my area of expertise, I would say nuclear uh, is an area that will be with us and will be growing. Thank you. Natik Bey, Natik Aliyev, Azerbaijan Energy is from Azerbaijan. He is the Minister of Energy. I suppose you are going to. You won't have to tackle with the nuclear issue in a short period of time. What would you say about that? First of all, I would like apologize for being late. You know, I don't find my way. <laughs> And uh, everybody, uh, welcome to this uh, session. And if you allow me, I uh, will uh, have my report on Russia because it's more, be more comfortable for me. Прежде всего хочу сказать, что, разумеется, ядерная энергетика это сегодня один из ключевых вопросов развития энергетики. Мои коллеги здесь сказали уже, что Разумеется, те традиционные первичные виды энергии, которым мы привыкли пользоваться на протяжении многих веков, а особенно в последние сказать, столетия, это нефть, газ, уголь. Разумеется, все это когда-то исчезнет. И все мы об этом знаем, потому что это исчерпаемые источники энергии. И человечество для того, чтобы развивать экономику, for countries' economies to develop, people are trying to look for cheaper sources of energy. We're searching for 
a type of energy that would give us uh, a huge thrust and push to our economic development, that would be accessible for all, that would allow countries and people to grow wealthy. One of such types of energy is, uh, is an alternative source of energy, alternative to uh, oil and gas, and one of them is nuclear energy. In the last 20 or 30 years, it has been developing quite vigorously. And if we look at energy consumption balances, we'll see that in the last decade, the share of nuclear was growing quite fast. Why was that happening? That was happening, first of all, thanks to technology development. Developed countries were implementing technical safety measures to make nuclear energy safer, more palatable. Everything was being done for nuclear plants to be operated in a more reliable manner. And we have to say that the world has succeeded. It's made fantastic strides. Yes, recent events in Fukushima, as my colleagues have already said, have slightly changed our approaches. Some countries have started to treat nuclear more cautiously, have put some of their nuclear development programs on hold. Some of them banned them. And nevertheless, all of us understand that many countries have started to revisit their nuclear development plans. Some nuclear power plant has been mothballed, shut down. Some of them are going to be mothballed, as I said already. So all of this is a natural natural um, reaction. But in answer to your question, I would say nuclear uh, power and nuclear power stations are here to stay. New power plant will be built. There is no alternative. The only question we can ask ourselves is how many and what will be done to enhance safety of a nuclear power plant and to protect it from any type of natural, anthropogenic, climatic, seismic disasters. Perhaps this is what humanity has to tackle now, mankind has to tackle now, safety. Now, let's turn to Azerbaijan. We are looking at countries that take up nuclear energy more vigorously. Of course, it's the countries that don't have energy sources of their own. Coupled with GDP that allows them technology innovation, technology breakthroughs, etc. And actually, Nuclear power will develop in countries with particular human capital, with qualified specialists, with raw materials. Now look at Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is well supplied with hydrocarbon resources. We estimate that Azerbaijan can maintain today's current level of oil production at 1 million barrel per day and 75 BCM of natural gas per day. So we can maintain this current production, even though we're a tiny country with a tiny population. These are high figures. And this rate of production can be maintained for about a hundred years. For another century, we can keep production at this level. The question then arises, does Azerbaijan need to build nuclear power stations today? And given this forecast and given these reserves that we have, and should countries like Azerbaijan look at nuclear power? Naturally, we're cautious. Naturally, we're cautious because there is no need today. Nevertheless, we study other people's experience very carefully. We carry out research. We understand that we have no nuclear resources, a raw material. We understand that we would need new resources, we need new technologies, and we would need personnel, trained staff. And we understand that we'd have to have a special regulator, very specialized system of control. 
So for now, we're just looking, and each country would have to solve this problem for itself. But taking on board realities of today, look at our region. Armenia has a nuclear power station. It was built in the Soviet times using obsolete technologies. It has been refurbished and its um, safety resource has been extended to 2017. It's been permitted to operate till 2017. But for Azerbaijan, Turkey, Iran, and other neighbors of Armenia, this power plant is a huge danger. And we keep clamoring for greater control. We keep asking for enhanced technology. Given the situation in the world, given our recent experience in Fukushima, we, we know that Ar Armenia and Azerbaijan are short of water. We don't have enough water to put the fire out. We don't have the water to, 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 to uh, mitigate to mitigate any such incident. So once again, yes, nuclear power has great future, but we have to treat it with caution, with handle with care. Thank you. Teşekkür ederim. Tabii ki e, bilhassa bu Thank son söyledikleri much, hakikaten e, hepimizin said, iyi düşünmemiz lazım gelen. Uh, reminds e, us that we need to rethink because uh, uh, the same holds true for Germany. If there's a nuclear power plant in France, even if you shut down the plants in Germany, it's not going to change much. Now, uh, Hamid Jafar Danatas, it's the uh, president of the uh, board, executive board. As you can see, dear guests, we have two consuming countries and three uh, producing countries, especially in natural gas and oil. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Well, I can certainly talk on uh, gas and oil, but uh, since your question is based on, uh, on nuclear, I, like uh, my friend Dr. Ashti, I'm a, a layperson in nuclear. But what, what is obvious is uh, the safety issues and concerns not only within one's country, but also with regard to the neighbors. And that's going to be and will be and will continue to be uh, a major issue. Having said that, uh, of course, many say that if you're uh, a uh, uh, hydrocarbon rich country, why would you need uh, to bother with nuclear? Uh, others have an argument that uh, even with uh, huge resources in hydrocarbons, it does make sense to uh, plan for having a base load of, say, 20 percent uh, for nuclear power. Uh, for electricity generation. Uh, of course, you need to reach a certain minimum uh, level of consumption to achieve that, so maybe 50, 50 to 100 megawatts, uh, 1,000 megawatts uh, for, um, for, for the whole, for whole of the country. But really, that's, that's all I can say. Um, as also Dr. Astish says, we've got enough problems uh, not to have to deal with uh, nuclear at this time. So maybe the next generation. Thank you very much. Now in this first round, we all uh, were able to briefly listen to uh, the thoughts. Let me try and summarize it all in one sentence. Now, uh, the attitude of Turkey is the one that attracts most of the attention, because contrary to uh, some of the uh, European countries, it's inclined in uh, the other direction. 
Um, one of our speakers says, no matter how careful you are, uh, if you have a another power plant five kilometers away from you, from your frontier, then what are you going to do about it? So this is something that we need to really think about. Now, uh, let me go to the second round. Actually, I believe that here, everybody is anxiously waiting that discussion. It's the new energy corridors. We have three uh, participants uh, who come from the uh, countries that have the resources. Two of the participants is going to talk about the fact that Turkey is at the point where the energy is going to go uh, to be transferred. And then we have also the consumers, uh, the energy consumers. Now let me put the question. The producers and the uh, consumers are here. What do you think about these new energy corridors? If you like this time, let's uh, begin with you so that you are not the last to speak. Uh, Mr. Hamid, you can have the floor. First to speak now. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think to uh, encapsulate this uh, whole discussion about energy corridors, it would be important to look at, first of all, uh, supply needs. Um, my, my expertise and experience is for over 42 years in the region in oil and gas, which is the by far the greater component of the energy mix globally. Uh, now, uh, the IEA estimates that uh, with respect to gas, for example, that between now uh, or for the next 25 years, consumption will increase by 50% globally. And I think most of that consumption will be fueled by economic growth in the MENA and uh, Eurasia uh, regions, you know, the subject of this uh, of this conference, and that's a, a very sizable uh, increase. Now, there's also added to that, or you can place on that the need within this region, certainly in the MENA region, for productive job creation for our youth, and it's uh, tens of millions of jobs that need to be created for the sake of our stability, for the sake of where we live, our neck of the woods. Um, uh, that obviously provides additional challenges. Um, and hopefully, we'll be successful in creating all these new jobs, which will then increase the, uh, the uh, demand figure I just, uh, I just gave you. Now, what are the challenges to uh, for our uh, policy makers, um, uh, what are the challenges and obstacles uh, to, to achieve the supply that's required and to have demand and consumption become more efficient? Uh, well, we're here as a panel. Um, uh, and particularly with um, three eminent ministers and policy makers, uh, we shouldn't just uh, analyze, I think we should uh, provide, uh, suggest solutions to this problem. And uh, uh, for me, the two major obstacles in addressing these challenges uh, from a policy level uh, are uh, two. One is uh, separating the role of regulator from regulated, and that would eliminate conflicts of interest. It uh, creates a level playing field competition and ultimately benefits the consumer uh, and encourages investment in supply. Uh, the second challenge is uh, eliminating, getting rid of the uh, curse, I would call it, of uh, energy subsidies. Uh, because that also uh, creates more 
efficient use of uh, our energy, eliminates runaway uh, demand, and so on. Um, these two elements are highly important. Uh, there's another obstacle which my, uh, uh, one of our colleagues yesterday, uh, <coughs> Mr. Sarkisian, I don't know whether he's here, he mentioned uh, the rule of law and respect for contract as being very, uh, very important uh, uh, elements and obstacles to overcome. So when you address, we, we have this issue of supply and we need within this region to satisfy our own supply. Indeed, right now, uh, the region has, uh, a cons it consumes about 50% in terms of gas of world production. Uh, and, um, but it has uh, around 80% of the reserves. And most of those reserves have been discovered uh, accidentally. Most of those gas reserves discovered accidentally over the last period when p companies and, and uh, explorers were really looking for oil. So there's a lot more gas uh, there and available. I don't want to go too much into the uh, the issue of gas and shale gas and how the gas market is going to uh, develop. But clearly, it is a fuel of the future. And uh, in the coming uh, decade or two, it's going to overtake coal as the second most important uh, energy resource uh, after oil. Uh, and yes, then you come to the corridor issue. It's vitally important to um, uh, uh, separate from the, the economics from the politics. And in that way, Turkey is ideally suited, really, I mean, the, the location to, in doing so, to benefit not only itself, but its neighbors. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Natik Bey. Thank you very much. For giving me floor. Uh, you know, when we speak about the energy corridors, uh, we uh, have to uh, have a very clear picture. What are the countries now? We, all the countries divided in two groups, with uh, producing countries and the consuming countries. And both of them not are independent, you know, of each other. They are, uh, depends from each other, because producing country would like to sell the energy resources, oil, gas, and so maybe in our sources. And uh, consumer countries would like to have very reliable source of uh, energy first, and uh, not the one source, but many, because uh, every country wouldn't like to be independent to be independent, would like. And uh, in our one, it's diversification for being very free, you know. That is why, you know, we, we, it is the uh, common interest when we speak about the energy corridors. If energy corridors, like in our region, is not one, but it is the very diversified, you know, in any uh, routes, it's give us more flexible uh, actions in, in our region. That is why first, the first, we, uh, our main task is to diversify all the directions of the delivering oil, gas, or our sources, energy sources to world market. This is first. The second one, it can be uh, transparent, it uh, can be uh, in the rule of non-discriminations to deliver to the markets. And uh, in the same uh, time, we uh, have to uh, make all the conditions for, for the consumer uh, countries, transit countries, and producing countries to be uh, you know, more uh, closer for cooperation. And uh, when uh, we start our strategy in Azerbaijan, uh, you know, before uh, 
declaring our independence, we have no way to come to the world market. Because what we produced, it was in just local market, in the market of the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union. That is why we have no, no way, you know, to deliver our uh, energy sources to, to European markets, you know, to uh, our countries. But uh, since uh, 1994, we uh, uh, have uh, to find new, new ways. That is why uh, we uh, construct uh, pipelines. It was the first pipeline, it was uh, Baku Novorossiysk through Russia to the Black Sea ports. The second one, we understand, understood very well in those times, you know, that if just one route, it is not, uh, you know, it's, it don't give us independence, you know. That is why in two hours after, we create the new way it was Baku Supsa, you know, in uh, oil uh, pipeline. And our one, it was the big one, main export pipeline, it was Baku Tbilisi Jehan, and we implemented with, uh, together with Turkey, you know. And it's, uh, you know, solve our problem in, in oil delivery to the markets. And after that, we start to think about the gas sources. And you know, we, now we have four, four pipelines. It's connect us, Azerbaijan, with our neighboring country, with Russia, with Iran, with Georgia, and Turkey. You know, that is why. And now we are uh, thinking about in our roots. And we are now working in Azerbaijan on the uh, uh, European Asia uh, oil corridor. You know, through Kazakhstan to Baku, Georgia, through Crimea, uh, Ukraine, uh, and Poland to up to Plotsk. The second one, it is the main uh, gas pipeline. We uh, have plans you, to expand the, our Baku Tbilisi Erzurum pipeline. We are working with Turkey now on the Trans Anadolu pipeline. That is why I think, in my mind, uh, more pipelines is better for producers, it's better for transit countries, and it's better for uh, consumers. Thank you. I'm pretty uh, çok eminim. E, bayağı bir soru, soru gelecek bu konularda. O yüzden şimdi hiç soruyu kendimi de tutuyorum, sormayayım diye. E, hemen e, the first e, sözü, uh, I'd like to give the floor now to Mr. Havrami. Now, of course, you are new in this uh, area uh, and uh, many have big hopes for your country. Yani what do you say? Corridor. Are you the new energy corridor? Uh, for sure, um, uh, Iraq is the country that everybody is looking at to fill the vacuum or at least stabilize the price and the consumption needs of the world. Uh, but for Iraq to actually deliver that, needs correct policies, needs market-driven policies to ensure uh, stability of supply and dependability of the supply. That is easy said than done. Iraq needs internal stability and security of its own before it can contribute to stability of the world. Uh, currently, we are a divided country still uh, after our liberation. Uh, until we come to terms that we can actually coexist and live in a stable country, you cannot depend 100% on non-interrupted supply of oil and gas from Iraq, unfortunately. But on the plus side, uh, I think uh, there's a lot of focus internationally on Iraq, and certainly uh, Republic of Turkey as a corridor is one of the primary uh, corridors for us, particularly the northern part of the country. In the Kurdistan region, despite some of the constitutional issues and difficulties we've been experiencing, we managed to attract some 50 companies to the region within four years of legislation we passed in 2007. We started from 1,000 barrel a day of uh, one well discovery uh, area. Now we have something like 20 discoveries. Uh, we estimate the region now to contain about 45 billion barrels of oil, significant amount of uh, natural gas and associated gas, 
and we are planning for sure to achieve one million barrels a day to catch up with Azerbaijan, hopefully by 2015. And uh, we think we can go to two million by 2019. This is a big, uh, stable part of Iran. I think we can deliver. Uh, but for that requires, of course, uh, we are at early stage of isolation, Azerbaijan we're in. We're the landlong region. We need policies that we can coexist with in Iraq, but at the same time, we need cooperation of our neighbors to, regardless of the politics, to get this energy to the market. The market needs it. Politics can catch up with that. Economy can drive the political thing to resolve the issues for us eventually. We are just like you started, sir, we're talking about building new pipelines and uh, with the private sector as well as uh, uh, other sectors coming into that, but particularly I believe private sector can be uh, uh, more efficiently and come up with the capital to do these things. So in in northern part of the country, uh, in Iraq, we anticipate, if our policies are correct, about three million barrels of oil to be flowing. Two of it coming from the region might be one additional million coming from the uh, neighboring provinces of uh, Kurdistan region. For that, there is no enough in infrastructure. Current capacity of the pipeline is about maximum 1.5. It cannot deliver more than 1.2. So we need to double that. And uh, we, for sure, uh, uh, if uh, we have it our way and the way things are going, uh, we think within a couple of years uh, that we will be some additional infrastructure to get the isolated crude of Kurdistan to the market. Currently, we have capacity to export about 300,000 barrels a day, 250, 300,000, in addition to the local refining. Uh, by next year, we can double that and then move on to a million barrels a day. What is preventing that is actually bad politics. Politics in Iraq currently, uh, people, uh, I don't want to dwell into this too much at the moment, but we have constitutional issue that uh, after the liberation of Iraq, uh, made Iraq as a federal state, not a heavily centralized state as it used to be under the previous regimes. But there are certain people, they still want to get it backward to that system. Unfortunately, it's not possible. Uh, people are different. We have uh, different nationalities, different religions, different experiences over the past of discrimination. It does not allow that policy to succeed. Therefore. One way or another, Iraq will have to come to terms to settle its own constitutional issue, but the world cannot stand by. The energy let it flow. We, any, any for example, oil we sell internationally, we commit it to uh, share it with Iraq and the, the constitutional arrangement we have. So we have no any desire taking one dollar extra out of the revenue of Kurdistan, apart from the, our fair share, which is as defi the, defined for, uh, uh, for the region under the constitution and the budgetary agreement. Uh, so, at the moment, uh, although there is a lot of uh, question mark and haggle uh, with our colleagues in Baghdad, we think soon people of Iraq recognize what Kurdistan has done for Iraq. And indeed, uh, the model we have put in place and practicing in Kurdistan now is gradually being copied by the other provinces. So I think in a difficult way, probably we arrive at the solution for the constitution, but it will be infinitely better if politicians sit down say, this constitution is written in stone. We cannot undo it, actually. 80% of Iraqi people voted for it, and the sooner we respect it, the sooner we, other people respect us. Uh, and other advice I have for oil companies and investors, not to get involved with the politics of Iraq regarding about advising people how to create a law and how to compromise. It doesn't happen. Iraqi people need to sit down and sort it themselves. And in the meantime, of course, from our region, we have developed fantastic relationship with the Republic of Turkey. As a part of Iraq, we are a corridor for the rest of Iraq. We share a vast border with Turkey. And uh, the current trade, uh, something like $8 billion with, with the region. I think we are probably the third or the fourth largest uh, region or country dealing with uh, Turkey. So that is what has uh, diminished any uh, problems between us, and that is growing. In fact, uh, uh, we expect that Kurdistan could become potentially number one trade partner thank for you. Turkey. That is as far as we've gone until now, and um, thank you. I'll answer some questions later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I see your signal. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. What is any thinking of these corridors? Thank you. Um, 
Again, we're bringing the European experience uh, to, to, to this scenario, and uh, Europe has been uh, traditionally exposed for a long time into the, what was perceived as the threat of dependence on Russia. But actually, if you see that uh, with the right angle, it was not never really a threat because uh, Russia always has been a reliable supplier, even during the Cold War, so never failed to um, fulfill its contracts. And on top, Europe um, now represents 62% uh, of Russian exports, but Russian share in the European market went from 75% to about 35%. So Europe diversified according to the concept we were expressing uh, b before. So um, the point uh, which now adds to the scenario is uh, um, the new uh, China consumption. So China is adding to the game. This is one key issue uh, in big amount. We have nuclear, which is subtracting gas on the other side. And we have the shale gas revolution, which is changing the supply and demand uh, scenario. So uh, we see a new dynamic which is going on, which is exactly based on uh, corridors and uh, infrastructure for transportation. So this is the new key uh, uh, of the game because uh, you should see now infrastructure not just as the vehicle to transfer these sources from producing countries to consumer countries, but it's going to be kind of the vehicle that secures new markets. And that's why China is uh, building as fast as possible, I mean China, Asia is building as fast as possible the connection to, to this new market, to this new demand, because this is changing the negotiating capacity, the negotiating strength of the traditional players. And Europe now has to face a new demand which might be secured by this new infrastructure. So the new infrastructures are going to be played as uh, uh, a way to block uh, this kind of negotiation. And this is uh, how, we, how we participate to the game, trying to have our company committed as much as possible into all the new corridors which are building up. Thank you very much. Mr. Minister, you have the last word. Well, I would like to welcome all the newcomers to this session. Welcome to Turkey and Istanbul. With regard to new corridors, Turkey has lots of advantages because of its um, geostrategic location. We'll make the best use of this. As you know, the tbilisi jehan pipeline, there's also the Kirkuk pipeline with Iraq, and they have been successfully operated for years. Baku Tbilisi Erzurum is a natural glass pipeline. Um, Nabucco ITGI top uh, are other projects uh, which we have developed. Now, basically, all of these. Um, in a way, coordinate and manage the mutual dependence, the interdependence. You spend, you invest in the field, um, and you compromise, basically, because the uh, producers need to sell, the consumers need to buy. In previous meetings, uh, we heard producers accuse the consumers of not coming up with their demand and orders on time. And the consumers have indirectly accused the producers of not delivering on time. But we have to know this is a common problem and we need common solutions. And in this respect, Turkey has been very positive to all projects. Turkey has been positive not only because of economic concerns, but also because of its strategic concerns with France, Italy, Germany, Austria, Bulgaria, Romania. Hungary, uh, who are consumers, we've always had good contact and coordination. We've developed a number of projects with them. We've also worked with Azerbaijan, Russia, Turkmenistan, Iran, Iraq, who are the producers. And Turkey has always developed common uh, projects with the producers because it's a win-win situation for all. If we win, everybody wins. Uh, at times, however, because of international, uh, we have disregarded international politics in these projects. We have to understand that these projects need international politics because these are projects that are five or seven billion dollars worth. 
they have an impact on international relations. In fact, they have a positive impact, a catalyst impact on international relations. So we cannot disregard international politics. For instance, Iraq. We give great importance to Iraq's territorial integrity and its administrative structure. We are ready to cooperate on all projects, including private uh, sector pipelines. We'd like to see Iraq improve in its economy. We believe these projects will contribute to Iraq's economy. In fact, all projects or each project that Turkey becomes involved in is strategically important. I think everybody has to know this. Now, the International Energy Agency says that coal, oil, and gas will still play a very critical role up to 75, 85 percent until the year 2050. Now, this, I think, has a bearing on our policies. All policies that we will become involved in will ha focus uh, on these developments. We will not refrain from previous projects. We will not refrain from traditional pipeline projects. I think all countries we've previously cooperated with with regard to pipelines know very well that Turkey is committed to all projects, both on the east-west and northwest uh, line. We will continue to become involved in all projects. Currently, the world consumes 91 million barrels per day, and we will have 6% of that in place soon. Developments in North Africa are critical. However, political instability might have a negative impact because in the past we saw political imbalances have an impact. If this, these difficulties did not stem from a disruption in the demand and supply chain. It was a disruption in political stability. We all know that political stability reigns. The fact that you have a sustainable political stability is a sine qua non, it's a precondition for all projects to succeed. That is why Turkey will continue to play a role in ensuring stability, both inside the country, in the region, and in the world. It will continue to adopt its constructive approach in the future as well. Thank you very much. And thank you for a perfect timing, because uh, we have 15 minutes for questions and answers. And actually, I know that I shouldn't raise questions. We should give the floor to the audience here. The first, let's take five questions first and answer those. If we have time, we'll take more questions. We have mobile microphones in the room. So if you want to ask a question, please introduce yourself first, very briefly, and please ask your question very briefly. If you have a person you're addressing, also mention the person so that we can save time. First five questions. Yes, please. Thank you. Aura Sabadus, I'm a journalist. I specialize in energy markets. I have two questions, actually, if I may. Um, the first question relates to oil indexation. I would like to know what is your opinion regarding the future of oil indexation for gas contracts? We see Asian utilities um, buying um, Henry Hub or NBP indexed gas. Do you think that in the future we might see the uh, erosion of oil indexation in gas um, contracts? And uh, secondly, um, Turkey is a very interesting market for um, investors, no doubt. It's growing, but Turkey has a very unwieldy cross-subsidy system in gas and electricity. And Mr. Jafar has already raised this point about subsidies. I would like to know what your opinion is regarding the subsidy system in Turkey. Thank you. Next. Okay, uh, there is one. Yes, please. I'm Barbara Judge, and I have been chairman of the UK Atomic Energy Authority. 
And I would like to congratulate Turkey on continuing its policy to continue nuclear power plants even in this day and age. The question that I have for the minister and for the rest of the, the um, panel is do you think nuclear is basically a political issue? That countries that really need nuclear will have it and will not be stopped by Fukushima. And countries that really didn't want it before are not going to continue after Fukushima will be an excuse. The reason I say it's a political issue is look at Germany. Germany knew that it needed nuclear power, but the politics was such that Mrs. Merkel closed the power stations. Now they will buy 10% more gas from Russia. They will buy, they will burn 10% more coal, and they will buy 10% nuclear from France, and everybody will pay 10% more for their, for their goods. Whereas Turkey has taken the courageous decision to continue on with its power plant, as will China and India and Russia and the United Kingdom, which is where I'm from. So do you think it's a political issue as opposed to a policy issue, an energy policy Thank issue? Thank you. My name, is, my name is Thomas Fuster. I'm correspondent for Swiss Daily Neue Zürcher Zeitung. In recent weeks, uh, we have uh, heard a lot of uh, talks and debates about the future of the Nabucco pipeline project. And a lot of people are arguing that this project is kind of a dead project already. What is your assessment on the prospects of the Nabucco pipeline in its original shape? Okay. And my question is, um, sorry, my name is Isla Jean Yackley. I'm a, also a reporter with um, Reuters here in Istanbul. And my question is for um, the energy ministers, Mr. Harami and Mr. Yildiz. Um, Mr. Harami discussed raising um, export capacity. And I wondered if there are any plans in the works for a uh, pipeline directly to Turkey that would bypass Kerkuk Jehan, which has been um, part of the problem with um, raising exports from Kurdistan. Okay, if you, if you allow me, I would go on to the answers. So let's see whether we have time afterwards. Uh, the first questions were uh, to the panel, who would like to answer the oil indexation question? Okay. Um, well, the, the, um, the gas market is in flux right now because of the advent of uh, shale gas in the U.S. So you can see when gas prices in the U.S. are uh, a, a quarter of what they are in uh, Europe and a sixth of what they are in uh, Asia, there is a huge imbalance. And at some point, so the jury is out. But it's certainly my feeling that uh, indexation uh, will not last. Uh, we, we have a, because of transportation, we're going to have a different uh, element. It will stabilize somewhere in between the two, mm -hmm. uh, or the two extremes. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't think uh, indexation is, uh, is here to stay. Okay. Second question was the Turkish subsidies in gas, I guess. Çok kısa, e, Very tabii briefly. bu gazla petrol arasında korelasyon now, için çok kısa bir örnek vermem lazım. Gazla petrol example. arasındaki makas the, gittikçe açılıyor. Uh, Birbirinin endeksi formüllerin, is, uh, ben de aynen Sayın Cevaplar gibi, like e, Jafar, gelişen e, sanayilerde, ekonomilerde markets, yavaş yavaş yerini countries, e, farklı fiyatlamalara bırakacak. Uh, because the world is a whole, it cannot be divided, but it looks like in gas, it is being divided. In four different regions, there are four different pricing mechanisms currently intact. So I believe that the trend which started with associate gas, what united us, will be divided, will be separated into different categories. Now, Turkey has changed in the last decade. It's not the Turkey of 10 years ago. The private sector's involvement 10 years ago was 34 percent in electricity. It's currently more than 60 percent. In natural gas, too, 
we will see this role increase. It's currently 28%. Cross-subsidies will be eliminated. I can tell you, we want a liberal market and we want private sector in competition with each other, but also supplying affordable uh, energy for the consumers. So we'd like to see this positive impact continue, but I can reassure you cross-subsidies will gradually disappear. Uh, our legislation is there, it's moving ahead in this direction, and so is our practice. Mr. Minister, thank you. Uh, Ms. Barbara Page also asked whether nuclear was a political issue. Is it? Well, yes, it is a political issue. I have been an MP for 10 years now, and I'm a minister in the current government. I know that managing internal policies sometimes uh, makes you let go of critical uh, issues. For instance, the UK, the UK is determined, but Germany is moving away. Turkey, on the other hand, uh, wants to follow the correct path. We saw that if you can tell your people what is right and what is beneficial for the country, the people support you. That is why we're determined and will continue to be determined for nuclear. With regard to Nabucco, there was a question addressed to all the panelists, I think, because there are at least three ministers here who are involved in Nabucco. Uh, one uh, of our uh, uh, audience asked whether the original shape will be maintained. Will it be maintained or will it change Nabucco? Mr. Minister? Well, when the contract was first signed, it was June 2009 when the agreement was signed. I made a statement which came out in the press. When it was signed, let me remind you, I said these big projects will always be vulnerable against threats, but it will they will also bring about many opportunities. So threats and opportunities, I said, will always be there. But relations between countries are dynamic. We cannot have static projects where relations are dynamic. Of course it's natural that content might change. It's even natural that the title or the name might change because relations are dynamic. The demand in Europe is rising. On the eastern parts of our region, newcomers, new producers are coming to the field. Maybe the name might not be Nabucco. Maybe it will be Nabucco West or Taba or ITG might take over. Who, who knows? Everything will have to uh, meet the demands, the new demands. It's Shahdinus Consortium and the private sector who will address the issues. They will select the proper projects. And no country should become too tense about it. It's only natural that dynamic relations determine the outcome. Now, can I ask you the same question, please? You know, when we are speaking uh, about Nabucco, Nabucco is a great project, and I agree with my colleague, you know. And the first idea was to bring and to find new source, new source from the Caspian Sea or from Iraq, from Iran, from Egypt, and so on. That is why it was a very big project from Baumkarton up to Iraq, like I said, and Caspian region and Egypt. Uh, but uh, the time is changing, you know, and a lot of new projects come uh, to reality. And uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Minister Tanay, already said about the uh, ITGI, TIP, AGRI, uh, Georgia, Romania, and, and, and our, a, lo a lot of uh, projects like the interconnections between the countries, uh, Greece, Bulgaria, and so on. And uh, all this, uh, you know, when we see just analyze this project, we see that all of them, it is real projects, you know. But uh, now, when we see, uh, when we speak about the Nabucco, maybe the origin idea of Nabucco, it's mm, transformed in, in other projects. Because, uh, you know, we, 
uh, we wait for Nabucco a Nabucco, uh, very long time. And uh, 10 years ago, it was a project with uh, five, seven billion euros. It was project from Baumgarten up to Caspian region or for up to uh, Turkey, or Iraq, Iran uh, sources and so on. Now, we don't see that, you know. We see that the price of uh, uh, Dabuka is going up to 20 bi billion euros. It is, a, it is known now, uh, you know, uh, sense to construct up to Caspian region because Azerbaijan constructs their own pipeline up to Turkey and now we are encouraged to prolongate it up to uh, border of Europe and, uh, and construct with TANAP. If we have a TANAP, Trans-Anatolian Cas Pipeline, why we need Nabucco, up, Nabucco project up to Caspian region? You know, that is why it's, it's, it's changing. The time is changing, the ideas ch is changing, the project is changing. That is why. I think that Nabucco will be. And maybe, uh, like my colleague said, it will be transformed on Nabucco West or CEP or some in our project. But the corridor, the corridor is exist. Corridor, this is the, uh, like we name it, uh, the uh, South Gas Corridor. It will be, and we are believe that it will be implement, implemented. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I believe uh, if we know something about politics, we got our answer to that. So uh, the last uh, question was from Reuters, I think, to Mr. Havrami. Yes. I personally like real projects. And when the project is on the map for almost seven, eight years, as a, it becomes boring, actually. Nobody believes in it. Uh, I remember seriously looking at Nabucco when we didn't have any gas actually found in Kurdistan region. Now we are ready to export more or less in a year or two. It's still on the map as a, a debate. So it's, it's not real. And a lot of competition came about now. I believe in competition. So our, our idea about gas export, first of all, is a big market for us in Turkey anyway. So it's easy to connect to the national grid and, and take it from there on. But the first pipe comes to, to be built. The corridor is there, it's Turkey. Uh, we will go with that, as simple as that. We have excess gas beyond Turkish needs and our own needs. We will go, what is the facility available? Whoever actually builds first, he will be within the, the project. So uh, that is uh, on the vocal. On as of uh, new pipeline, uh, Iraq, as I said in my initial remarks, needs to increase capacity export uh, from the northern part of the country. If we are serious getting to seven, eight, nine million barrels a day, as uh, some people forecast, then at least three of it will come from through Kurdistan region or from Kurdistan region. And we need additional pipeline anyway. And in my view, the, the best uh, practice is pipeline to be built by, uh, by uh, private sector. And uh, they can come up with a design and implementation very quickly. And I expect to see a new pipeline within two years if we go that route. If we design a line of work and becomes uh, a lot of intergovernmental, a lot of politics involved with it, it takes 10 years. So we need to go with the private sector, and uh, from our point of uh, view, we've been encouraging that, and we support any project initiated uh, by private sector. And uh, the tariff arrangements, all the money will go from our side, will go to Treasury in Iraq, and the Turkish side obviously regulate uh, their, uh, their uh, internal uh, needs. Uh, so would it be an alternative to Kharkuk Jehan pipeline? The answer is no. Uh, as I said, we need another additional capacity of one and a half, two million barrels. And the sooner we start building a new pipeline, the better for the country, for Turkey as well as for Iraq. So it is not really uh, a pipeline to bypass uh, the current infrastructure. The current infrastructure we hope we can fill as soon as possible by increasing the production. But we forecast uh, two issues, one, increased capacity in production, and second, actually, the type of crude oil we have in Kurdistan is lends itself to heavier oil in some, some of the major discoveries. 
and it will be uh, wise to have a separate transportation because otherwise you'll mix very high API gravity, very low, and you reduce the value of it. So for, for just technical and economic reasons, you need it anyway. Thank you very much. Çok teşekkürler. Uh, I know. Uh, well, bu kadar kısa zaman içinde, e, bu kadar you know, in such a short time, yok. it's impossible e, to discuss everything thoroughly. E, Transparency, e, regulation, e, and policies are important, e, all producers e, said, and e, these need to be improved e, as much as possible. E, I'd like to thank all panelists for being here. Thank you for your valuable speeches and insights.